Hello, this is Daniel Barnett from Outer Temple Chambers and welcome to episode 72 of Employment Law Matters on unfair versus wrongful dismissal. Before I start, I've just started a YouTube channel. You can look at it at bit.ly slash YouTube legal bit.ly slash YouTube legal and I'm slowly going to be putting all of these podcast episodes on the YouTube channel but more importantly it's got extracts from my LBC show where I talk to people who phone in on a Saturday night and answer their questions about both employment law and all sorts of other legal questions and it's got some dedicated videos that I've recorded just for the YouTube channel, and also some of my other stuff that I've pulled out of the archives, videos of seminars I've given, videos of tours. I've just uploaded one on the employment law implications of Brexit. Check that one out. Please subscribe bit.ly slash YouTube legal. Now, it's a quirk of UK employment law that there are two separate and distinct claims that can be brought, leaving aside any issue of discrimination in challenging a dismissal. Unfair dismissal is a claim created by statute. It's in Part 10 of the Employment Rights Act 1996. Wrongful dismissal for all but the highest earners is generally a much less financially valuable claim. It's a contractual claim where the employee alleges the dismissal wasn't carried out in accordance with the contract. Both claims can be brought in the employment tribunal, although an employee hoping to recover more than £25,000 for wrongful dismissal needs to pursue that claim in the normal civil courts. So what are the differences between wrongful and unfair dismissal? Welcome to Employment Law Matters with Barrister Daniel Barnett. Let's start with damages for wrongful dismissal. The damages available for wrongful dismissal are quite limited. And that's because wrongful dismissal is essentially a claim that the employer has not given the employee the right period of notice. In a breach of contract claim, damages are awarded which seek to place the innocent party in the same position they would have been in if the contract had been performed properly. Now, since most contracts of employment allow either side to terminate the contract by giving notice... All the employee is allowed to recover in a wrongful dismissal claim is what they would have received if proper notice had been given. And a payment in lieu of notice normally takes care of any potential damages in a wrongful dismissal claim. An employer is, of course, entitled to dismiss an employee without notice, often referred to as a summary dismissal, if they've committed an act of gross misconduct. Essentially, that's a fundamental breach of contract on the part of the employee, which allows the employer to treat the contract as at an end. That doesn't, of course, prevent an unfair dismissal claim, but it does prevent a wrongful dismissal claim. Just because the employees committed gross misconduct and thus lost the right to a notice period and thus lost the right to a wrongful dismissal claim, that doesn't absolve the employer of the need to behave reasonably in deciding whether or not to dismiss, which is what an unfair dismissal claim is all about. And this brings us to the key difference between claims for wrongful and unfair dismissal. Unfair dismissal is ultimately about whether the employer has acted reasonably. Wrongful dismissal is about whether the employer was entitled to dismiss the employee with or without notice. Unfair dismissal is about how the employer has behaved. Wrongful dismissal is about how the employee has behaved. When a tribunal is deciding an unfair dismissal claim, the guilt of the employee is technically irrelevant, at least to liability. It may result in a substantial, if not complete, reduction in compensation. For liability, what matters is whether the employer's belief in the employee's guilt was genuine and reasonable and whether the employer followed a fair procedure before deciding to dismiss. In a wrongful dismissal claim, the employer's belief is neither here nor there. What matters is whether the tribunal or the court finds the employee is actually guilty of gross misconduct. So that means a dismissal might be wrongful even if it's fair. Now, that shouldn't happen often. Usually the evidence that convinced the employer 
of the employee's guilt will also convince the tribunal. But it's perfectly possible for the tribunal to listen to the employee's evidence and believe their explanation, even while accepting that the employer was acting fairly and reasonably in taking a different view. So that would mean the employee wins their wrongful dismissal claim because the tribunal believes their explanation and finds them not guilty, but loses their unfair dismissal claim because the tribunal thinks that, even though it wouldn't have reached the same decision, the employer had nevertheless acted reasonably. Employers have to be aware that no matter how reasonably they have behaved, there remains a risk that an employee dismissed for gross misconduct could still win something if the tribunal happens to believe their side of the story. And the same can happen the other way round. An employee can lose a wrongful dismissal claim because the tribunal finds that there was gross misconduct, but win the unfair dismissal claim. The tribunal might find the procedure was flawed or unusually in a gross misconduct case but not unknown, that dismissal was outside the range of reasonable responses. Now, in that scenario, the employee's compensation for unfair dismissal is, of course, limited because the tribunal would normally reduce compensation considerably, sometimes by as much as 100%, to reflect the employee's wrongdoing and the likelihood that dismissal would still have been the result, no matter how fair the procedure. The key point is you can't simply assume that claims for unfair dismissal and wrongful dismissal will always be decided the same way. The two claims are about different things. Search Daniel Barnett for Employment Tribunal Advice and Representation. Now, a good example of a tribunal getting this wrong, twice in fact, is the case of East Coast Main Line and Cameron. Mr Cameron was a shunter. In November 2015, he cleared a train for departure from the depot while the driver of another train was standing on a narrow road running between two tracks. As a result, the departing train brushed the driver on the road, and this was regarded quite rightly as a serious incident. The driver could easily have been killed, and Mr Cameron was responsible for making sure trains departed safely. He knew there was a driver on the site preparing his train for departure, and should have checked that driver's location before allowing the other train to depart. He was dismissed for gross misconduct. The employment tribunal found the employer had behaved reasonably. It had carried out a fair investigation. It had followed a fair disciplinary process. Its conclusion that the employee was guilty of gross negligence in performing his duties was a reasonable one, and dismissal was within the range of reasonable responses. They then held the unfair dismissal claim failed and that, as a result, the claim for wrongful dismissal must also fail. This was held by the Employment Appeal Tribunal to be an error of law. The wrongful and unfair dismissal claims were not tied together in this way. The tribunal had been scrupulous when considering the unfair dismissal claim not to substitute their view of the facts for those of the employer. And they found the employer reasonably concluded the employee was guilty of gross misconduct, but as was quite proper when considering unfair dismissal, they'd not made any finding as to whether they agreed with the employer's conclusion. But that was precisely the issue they were meant to decide when it came to the wrongful dismissal claim. So the Employment Appeal Tribunal sent the case back to the same Employment Tribunal to decide that issue. When it did so, the Employment Tribunal found the employee was not guilty of gross misconduct after all. They said his behaviour was a one-off incident in a confused situation. It wasn't willful misconduct. They said the driver who was brushed by the train could have done more to communicate with the employee. And while the employee was responsible for safety on site, there was no specific policy or procedure he'd breached. Rather, he just failed to make sure he was aware of the situation in the depot before clearing the train for departure. The tribunal also held his length of service. It was 35 years. was a relevant factor in their conclusion this wasn't such a grave act of misconduct or negligence that it warranted summary dismissal. And that prompted another appeal to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, this time by the employer, which resulted in the unusual finding that the tribunal's conclusions were perverse. Given the facts, 
said the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the only proper conclusion here was that the employee was guilty of gross misconduct. Just pause a moment, go back to the first appeal, which was held to be an error of law, where it was said that the two weren't tied together in that way. Try and work that one out. But hey, one can't always expect complete consistency from the courts. It is worth noting here that there's no problem with the fact that Mr Cameron's conduct was negligent rather than deliberate. Negligence can amount to gross misconduct, provided it's sufficiently grave and weighty so that it can poison the relationship between employer and employee. That was what the Court of Appeal held in the 2017 case of Adesokan and Sainsbury's supermarkets. In Mr Cameron's case, The Employment Appeal Tribunal pointed out he knew it was his responsibility to carry out adequate safety checks, and he didn't do that. The consequences could have been catastrophic, potentially leading to a loss of life. As for his length of service, it was wrong of the tribunal to find that this lessened the seriousness of what he'd done. Indeed, it was reasonable to expect that employees who'd carried out a role for a long, long time would have sufficient experience and expertise to meet the required standard. So the finding of wrongful dismissal was reversed. And it is clearly the right outcome. Length of service is a factor that a reasonable employer should take into account when deciding the appropriate penalty for misconduct, though the weight should vary from case to case. But it's fundamentally part of the question of reasonableness. And accordingly, it belongs in the consideration of an unfair dismissal claim, rather than a wrongful dismissal claim. The tribunal's apparent confusion over the right approach to wrongful and unfair dismissal shows how easy it is to lose sight of the important distinction between the two. Check out Daniel Barnett's books on Amazon. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do do two things. Number one, subscribe to my new YouTube channel, bit.ly slash YouTube Legal. On that, you'll find, as I said a moment ago, All the new episodes of this podcast and we're slowly uploading old ones. You'll find lots of LBC clips from my LBC show and you'll find seminars and extracts from other talks I've given all up there ready for you to watch. bit.ly slash YouTube legal. And also leave a review on the podcast chart. Go to the Apple store, search for Employment Law Matters and leave a review if you would. Leaving those reviews gives me the incentive to keep producing more of these podcasts. If you enjoy them, please do leave a review and hit subscribe if you haven't previously done so. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Barrister Daniel Barnett from Outer Temple Chambers. Bye-bye. Any information on this podcast is for general guidance only. Always seek legal advice. Please see full terms at www.danielbarnett.co.uk forward slash podcast terms.